we've done this so many times. Blessings to you guys at uh, New Hope. Um, I, I feel like a like the uh, old ball glove or shoe that the dog keeps dragging up. But this is, you know, we do this pretty regularly, at least once a year. It's like coming home. And so thanks for making Lacey and me both feel uh, very welcome. Uh, it's great to be with you. Greetings from Evangel University and Assemblies of God Theological Seminary or Cemetery, your choice. And um, we just uh, we love being with you guys. So this is a fun weekend. Looking forward to tonight. This morning, we're going to deal with the subject of um, uh, the, the day of Pentecost, Acts chapter 2. We just celebrated it uh, recently in June, um, but uh, you guys, I think, are in a series, and so we're trying to tap into that, and this morning, we're going to talk about uh, the day of Pentecost and the outpouring of the Holy Spirit as being uh, pictured in Scripture like a Christian Mount Sinai. Uh, the, the Sinai event, the Sinai experience, the giving of the law, the constitution of a new people, the state, the people of Israel, and God's uh, major download in revelation and speaking to them. Uh, tonight, we're going to be, be talking about Acts chapter 2 as well, but uh, we're going to look at a little different piece of Acts chapter 2. We're going to look at the connection between the um, infilling with the Holy Spirit and King David and the son of David. So I think that you will um, uh, uh, benefit from uh, making, a, a, giving yourself access to that stuff as well as what we do this morning. So the day of Pentecost, the Christian Mount Sinai. The, the word Pentecost is not a normal English word. We don't use that in everyday talk, right? Unless you're describing yourself as a Pentecostal. Where does that come from? Um, it actually means, um, it, the, it's a Greek word that means 50. So blessings to you guys, you 50-ers. It doesn't really work that well, does it? 50-ers? Pentecostals. Okay, so um, where does the 50 come from? All right, well, uh, the Hebrew word that lies behind that, I've written it on, on the screen, and it's in italics. It's the word shavuot. It's the plural of shavua. It means weeks. Well, what does that mean? Okay, greetings, you weakers. That probably doesn't work real well either. Um, but the point is, is that the, the, the festival of, of Pentecost, or weeks, or shavuot, uh, happens seven weeks after Passover. Uh, you determine when uh, the festival of Pentecost is on the basis of counting seven weeks, 49 days, and then the fifth day is the, is the 50th day, the, and that's the, the Feast of Pentecost, or Shavuot, uh, or weeks. Um, here's some Bible behind that. In Leviticus 23, it says, in the first month, on the 14th day of the month, um, at, at twilight is the Lord's Passover. So there's a specific point in time when Passover is supposed to happen. Pentecost then is dependent on Passover, 50 days after the Passover. So, scripture on that. Leviticus 23, Deuteronomy 16, you shall count for yourselves from the day after that Sabbath, the one that concludes the festival of Passover, from the day that you um, brought in the sheaf of the wave offering, and that doesn't refer to me, thank you very much, this is Wave's World, party on Garth, okay, thank you very much, that was the first video that I saw, a movie that I saw after I completed my comprehensive exams at Hebrew University, three days of testing nine hours a day, 133 pages written, um, and did I say three days? Four days. Um, and there was nothing left. So just to kind of recoup, refresh, Wayne's World Part One. Thank you very much. All right, so uh, when you brought in the sheaf of the wave offering, it's not like, hey God, I'm trying to get your attention kind of wave. The Hebrew is truma. It actually means you lift it up. You offer this up to God. So that's the meaning uh, of any time you see in your English Bibles, wave offering. It actually means the offering that is lifted up to God in worship. Kind of like what you just did. It offered up a sacrifice of praise because his name is worthy of it. Okay, so 
the wave offering, there will be seven complete Sabbaths. How often does Sabbath uh, take place? Every seven days, right? Every seven days. So once a week. So if you have seven Sabbaths, that means you've got seven weeks. Seven times seven is, mathematicians, 49. Plus one is Pentecost in Greek. The 50th day. You shall count 50 days. That's, that, that makes, they did the math for us on this one. The last passage, you shall count 50 days to the day after the seventh Sabbath, and then you present a new grain offering. So think of it like this. Jesus comes, his incarnate ministry, he's ministering to 12 people. Then he had one other point, he's got 70 people. There's 120 on the day of Pentecost. There's just lots of fruit from Jesus' ministry. People healed and raised from the dead and delivered from demonic spirits and stuff all over the place. There is a harvest going on in Jesus' earthly ministry of three, three and a half years. True or false? See, I get to do this because I'm a professor. It's a, it comes with a union membership. This pop quiz things you remember probably from last time. Maybe you haven't recovered. Okay, that's all right. Um, uh, so, uh, let's see. 49 plus 1. 50, all right? And so God is in this new uh, offering, this new grain offering, there's another harvest that takes place, yes? Of 3,000 on the day of Pentecost. I'd call that a, a new grain offering, new harvest, yes? All right, so uh, scholars have raised the question, well, question, uh, Israel's a very arid climate. Jerusalem has very little water source. And so how do you baptize 3,000 people in one day, as the Bible says? So, well, that must have been hyperbole, kind of evangelistically speaking. You know, it's sort of an exaggeration. But no, when archaeology comes into play, well, first of all, when meteorology comes into play, Jerusalem gets about as much rain each year as we do here, maybe a couple of inches less. So we're not talking about a dry, arid climate. You remember the Bible describes the land of Israel as a land that is um, flowing. There you go. So is it one or is it the other? I think I'm going to take the Bible's version. And then when you go there, like many of you New Hopers or you 50ers or Weekers or whatever y'all were calling yourself just a few minutes ago, when y'all go to Israel and you're right there with your buddies from New Hope, and, and I'm there, and Pastor Weaver's there, and other folks on the staff are there, and we're just having a wonderful time learning. You're walking into the world of the Bible, and it is major 5D and high def. I mean, it, you are walking into biblical reality. As I say often, I'm happy for you to have the opportunity to walk where Moses and Abraham and David and where Jesus walked, but I'm even happier to see you walk like Jesus walked. And that happens too. So when you're there and you see the abundance of plant life and animal life and water all over the, the place and the like, you go, wow, this isn't what Hollyweird pictured Israel as. Yeah, and you realize I have to choose. I have to choose between the unreality that we are offered so often in our, me in our visual media here and what we're seeing and experiencing with our own two eyes in the land of the Bible, walking in the place of all these you know, great saints, people of God uh, in the Bible. And it does change your perspective. I want to encourage you to take the opportunity. Uh, but back to our, our study. Um, then you shall grain offering. You, point number two. In the uh, Old Testament, the Feast of Shavuot weeks or Pentecost in the Old Testament, it was an agricultural festival. You saw that, I think, already in the, in, in the scriptures, but this is an agriculture festival. And so you have the opportunity this time of year at Passover time and also um, at, at uh, the um, festival of um, the ingathering at the end of the, of the year um, that is uh, the third festival, you get like two or three weeks off every so often. That's like six weeks of vacation every year. But then you got to also factor in Sabbath. That's once a week. You got to factor in nighttime, you know, when we sleep. You, you have to factor in every seventh year when God says you take off the whole year. You don't plant, you don't harvest, 
You just eat what grows of itself and just hang out and love on me and enjoy my presence and have a good time reconnecting with family and friends and worshiping God and studying the word and stuff like that. And then if that's good, not good enough for you, you get after every seventh year, on every 50th year, you get what is called a Yuval or a Jubilee. And so sometimes you get back-to-back -back years off. Sounds like God's into rest, doesn't it? For all of you recovering alcoholics, come on. Sounds like God's really interested in rest. Day and night. Wow. Sounds like he's a God of balance. And he wants to work that into our lives too. But I digress. Agricultural um, festival. Celebration that's taking place uh, right uh, just a couple of months ago in June. And... Uh, here we hear this in Scripture. This is not something that we're, you know, just making up as we go along. The Bible tells us, celebrate the Feast of Weeks, that is, the first fruits of wheat, agriculture, uh, first fruits of the harvest, and first fr feast of ingathering at the turn of this year. Three times a year, all of your males will appear before the Lord your God, the God of Israel. So this is a neat time of rest and celebration and reconnection with family and friends and visiting the temple and making pilgrimage and celebrating and loving God and worshiping and studying his word. All of that all rolled together. Book of Numbers. On the day of the first fruits, when you present a new grain offering to the Lord, you shall have a holy convocation. Do no laborious work. This is what God is into on the festival of weeks or Pentecost or Shavuot. You shall begin to count seven weeks from the time that you begin to put the sickle into the standing grain. Is an agriculture harvest festival? Yes. That's exactly what we're seeing described. When you began to harvest the standing grain, then you shall celebrate the festival or feast of weeks to Yahweh your God, and you shall rejoice before the Lord your God in the place where the Lord your God chooses to put his name, establish his name, and you shall remember that you were a slave in Egypt. Let's take a look at some imagery so that we're able to uh, get connected to physical reality. Um, Hopefully I can go on both screens, but let's start this way. This is the city of Jerusalem on, um, uh, from a satellite image. You can see uh, on the image the um, Temple Mount, as well as the Dome of the Rock right here. Here's the edge of the Temple Mount going around here. Here's the city wall of Jerusalem as it existed in the 1500s A.D., the main valleys that, that define Jerusalem are the Kidron Valley, the Central Valley, and the Hinnom Valley over here on this screen. And for you guys, if you saw that, just for review, we have the Temple Mount here. Temple Mount here. The city of Jerusalem, the, the wall from the 1500s A.D., going around like this. Then we have the main valleys, the Kidron Valley here, the Central Valley here, the, the um, Hinnom Valley right here, all running together right out about the Pool of Siloam. Um, and uh, then we have uh, the southern steppes where more than likely the people that were filled with the Spirit began to address the multitudes because it's the Feast of Shavuot, the Feast of Weeks. The Feast of Pentecost, people from all over the world were coming here and there's a bottleneck of traffic that runs into the Temple Mount from the southern steps, from these southern steps into the Temple Mount where the temple existed right about the Dome of the Rock. Now where did these guys come from? More than likely the Western Hill. That's this other yellow circle that I've drawn up on the western hill and it's only about a five to ten minute walk depending on how fast you walk which direct which way you take coming straight down from the western hill to the southern steps where then they can they can impact a multitude from all over the world um, here's another uh, look at the same from an aerial shot we're looking from the mount of olives or rather from the west toward the mount of olives here's the mount of olives long ridge 
going north-south, kind of stretching the full length of the city of Jerusalem, the Kidron Valley that is in the shadow. Now we have the, the city of Jerusalem running around like this, the city wall. This is the Temple Mount again, and in the middle is the Dome of the Rock. Here are the southern steps. Uh, by the way, here is the, uh, the, the Judean hill country. The Bible says that John the Baptist appeared in the wilderness of Judea, preaching a, a baptism of repentance. So not far from Jerusalem, the Judean hill country. You can even see all the way down to the Dead Sea, this little strip of blue. So again, and for some folks in the middle review, the Dead Sea, this little strip of blue, the Judean wilderness, then the Mount of Olives, the Kidron Valley, the Central Valley, the Hinnom Valley, and then the city of Jerusalem, defined by those three valleys. And this is the Temple Mount. These are the southern steps. Here's where the temple was in this general area here. So now we kind of have our bearings just a little bit, yes? Let's look at it from another perspective. Now you're on the Mount of Olives and you're looking toward the Temple Mount. There's the southern wall of the Temple Mount, and these are the steps that more than likely the people uh, that were in the upper room, the 120, on the day of Pentecost week's Shavuot, experienced an empowerment of God's Spirit come on, coming upon them as Jesus promised He would do. When He leaves, He sends back the Comforter, and these guys make their way <clears throat> from this area on the northern on the western hill downhill to the temple mount steps to go in um, and so the festival a second the, a, a third point is the feast of passover was celebrated in the first century not so much as an agricultural festival as it was celebrated in the original times in times in the times of moses but by the times of Jesus, 1,400 years later, it had sort of morphed under the teachings of the Pharisees to be a celebration of the giving of the law at Mount Sinai, Ten Commandments, Exodus 19 and 20 and the like. So that's what we want to look at now as a background for understanding Acts chapter 2 and the event of the day of Pentecost that was like a defining moment of the early church of the first century first generation followers of Jesus. So let's take a look at some uh, passages both in the Bible and outside the Bible that help frame the understanding of Acts 2 in its original context. Exodus chapter 19 says that it was the third month after Israel had left Egypt. And on that day they came to the wilderness of Sinai. The rabbis took this verse, and under, the early rabbis from the time of Jesus understood this verse to be referring to the time of year when, when uh, the Feast of Pentecost was celebrated. The third month after the sons of Israel <coughs> had left Egypt. When they set out from Rephidim, they came to the wilderness of Sinai and they camped in the wilderness, and there Israel camped in front of the mountain, Mount Sinai. In the, early, the writings of the early rabbis from before, during, and just after the time of Jesus, this is what we read. The sages, the, the ancient rabbinic authorities, the rabbis, taught that on the sixth of the month of Sivan, that's May, June, and that's when we celebrate pa uh, Pentecost, the Ten Commandments were given to the Jewish people. Here's a passage that's even more specific. Same, uh, same collection, the Babylonian Talmud. It says, the festival of Shavuot. Can you translate that into English, you Hebrew scholars? Shavuot, weeks. Pentecost. It all means the same thing. The festival of, Sh uh, festival of Shavuot is the day on which the Torah was given. There it is, end of story. These guys in ancient times are teaching that the festival of Pentecost was the day on which the law was given on Mount Sinai. And one must celebrate the fact that the Torah was given to the Jewish people on the feast of Shavuot slash weeks slash Pentecost. Also, uh, we have this text that is like way important and I think really helpful. All the nations were represented at Mount Sinai for the giving of the law. Hmm. 
Do you remember that mixed multitude that the Bible says went up from, Is from Egypt along with Israel? Exodus chapter 12. So that means that representatives of all of us, at least according to the rabbis, they understood that all of the traditional 70 nations of the world were present at the giving of the law. Now, and all the nations heard the giving of the law in their own language. Whatever that language was, some kind of way that voice that was communicating the law to Israel is also making it available to all the nations of the world. And it says only Israel was willing to accept it. Now, my Jewish guide friends tell this joke that uh, when Moses came down from, the, from Mount Sinai, he said, hey, God's got a law for you. All the other nations said, we're not interested. Israel said, how much does it cost? They said, Moses said, nothing. He said, Israel said, then we'll take two. Um, <laughs> if you can tell, you, if you're Jewish, you can tell that joke. If you're not, then you can't. Since I'm not, then I take all that back. But I didn't tell the joke. It's my Jewish friends in Israel who tell that joke. Anyway, it's just for fun. Um, back to text. In the same collection of literature, that, that big Honkin collection, the Babylonian Talmud, it says every single word that went forth from God was split up into 70 languages. The 70 keeps recurring. The school of Rabbi Ishmael taught it's like a hammer that breaks the rock in pieces. It's a quote from the, quote from the book of Jeremiah. Just as a hammer is divided into many sparks, so every single word that went forth from the Holy One, blessed be He, split up into 70 different languages. So we're talking about a miracle of communication that's going on. When God gave His law because He wanted it communicated to, available to everybody, and not just one nation of one language. Here's one more text, and this, is one, this one is the most important. The Ten Commandments were disseminated by a single voice, yet the Scripture says all the people perceived the voices. Our translations typically read the thunderings, but the word in Hebrew there is kolot, voices. Kol is voice, kolot is voices. That's really interesting. The Ten Commandments, God's Word from Mount Sinai, was disseminated by a single voice, but it was perceived, the people perceived multiple voices. Hmm. This shows, the rabbis say, that the voice went forth, but it was divided into seven voices that then became 70 tongues of sev the 70 nations. And every nation received the law in its own language. God wants to make His word his revelation available to everybody. That's what the ancient rabbis are teaching. Now, this business of 70, this is interesting because it's in our sacred tradition too. You heard it in the rabbis' ancient interpretations of this ancient work we call the Old Testament. But here you see it in our divine revelation given through uh, Luke the Gospel writer. He says that Jesus sent out not only the 12 who were sent to the lost sheep of the house of Israel, Matthew 10 and Matthew 15, but he also sent out another group of people. In addition to the 12 that were sent to Israel, he sent out 70. That's interesting. He just kind of pulled that number out of a hat, didn't he? It's just totally an accident that the ancient rabbis from his time are talking about God speaking some, in some miraculous sort of way in 70 different languages to the traditional 70 people groups of the world. And then Jesus picks 70. In addition to the 12, he picks 70 and sends them out and says, go out and preach the gospel, bring healing to people, cast out demons, and tell them that the kingdom of God has come. That's totally accidental, right? Yeah, right. Sure. The 70 return with joy saying, Lord, even the demons are subject, subject to us. You know they still are? In the name of Jesus? Uh, but that's only to ordained AG ministers though, right? Wrong. In Acts chapter 2, verses 5 and 17, we hear this. There were Jews living in Jerusalem from every nation under heaven. 
They come from all the nations, also proselytes, people who had converted from paganism to Judaism, so that rep the representatives of all 70 nations are there on the day of Pentecost. And then, in the middle of Peter's Pentecost sermon, he quotes the prophet Joel, chapter 2. Interesting, Joel 2, Acts chapter 2. That's pretty easy to remember, right? He quotes Joel, and Joel says, I'm going to pour my spirit out on all flesh, all mankind. Again, that's God's intention. The rabbis are saying that was God's intention at Mount Sinai. What Peter is saying on the day of Pentecost, trying to interpret what in the world is going on here on those southern temple steps, he's telling people this is a fulfillment of what Joel said, and Joel's saying it's going to, he's going to pour his spirit out, spirit out on everybody. No one's disqualified. Everyone's written into the circle. Everybody. And at the very end, Peter circles back and he says, this promise is to you, your children, and all who are afar off, even as many as the Lord our God shall call to himself. Nobody's left out of the circle. I want to talk to you about another passage from ancient literature. I know that this is a little bit odd, but if we don't do it now, you're probably never going to encounter this material. It's not because it's unavailable. This is on the internet at earlyjewishwritings.com, and then you just click on Philo. Who was Philo? He was a Jew. He lived in Alexandria in Egypt. He was, though, he was a first century Jew who wrote in the same Greek that our New Testament is written in. And he was a contemporary, meaning he lived at the same time that Jesus lived and that the apostles ministered after the earthly ministry of Jesus was completed. This guy's an important guy. He wrote more than any other ancient author ever, anywhere, of any type of literature in any kind of language. This guy, Philo of Alexandria, left us 12 volumes of stuff. Bible interpretation, historical material, all kinds of really cool stuff. I'm just going to bring to you one passage from Philo. I promise we'll get out on time. No, not all 12 volumes. Not the full download. You can go to earlyjewishwritings.com and read Philo till Jesus comes back, okay? But we're going to look at this one passage because it deals with the giving of the law on at Mount Sinai. And I want you to listen to the kind of terms that this first century contemporary of Jesus, contemporary of the apostles, living on the day, the, the day, the day that Pentecost happened in Acts 2, I want you to listen to how he describes the kind of words that he uses to describe the giving of the law at Mount Sinai. Let's look. The voice proclaiming the Ten Commandments was a rational soul filled with clearness and distinctness. That means everybody could understand it. Was that an emphasis on the day of Pentecost in Acts 2? Everybody could understand what God was saying through these people, his representatives. F clearness and distinctness, which was fashioned in the air... He's forming this voice, this sound, through the airwaves that then um, fashioned in the air and stretched it out into a kind of flaming fire. Wow. That's what this first century author is saying. That's what the giving of the law at Mount Sinai looked like. My question is, is that what the day of Pentecost, weeks, Shavuot, looked like in Acts chapter 2? Yeah. Yeah. We've got it right below there, Acts 2. And there appeared to them tongues or flames as of fire, distributing uh, themselves and rested on each one of them. What happens next? And they were, verse 4, they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began speaking as God was giving them utterance. Isn't that interesting? Okay, so let's look at some more Philo. You're convinced now, right? Because this is a bunch of stuff. This is a download but it's totally so worth it, I promise. In Exodus 19, we hear that all of Sinai was in smoke because God was present. He descended upon the mountain in fire. Okay, and then Exodus 20, 
all the people were perceiving the thunder and the lightning flashes, but that's not what the Hebrew says. The Hebrew word, there's, you can say he, lightning flashes in Hebrew, but what we hear in this passage is lapidot. It's torches or flames of fire. Modern Hebrew uses that word for, for flashlights. Torches of fire on the mountain. Flames of fire distributing upon each one of the uh, disciples on the day of Pentecost. There is a connection there. Evidently, that's what Philo was picking up on when he describes these, this voice that w went forth that was, just, that was formed in the air and became like a flame of fire. He's not pulling that out of nowhere. He's taking that from his cues in the Hebrew Bible. Philo says this, And so sounded forth so long and articulate a voice. What does articulate mean? Understandable. Clearly spoken and understandable. And that's exactly the emphasis that we get in Acts chapter 2. Each of us are hearing them speak in our own language. How is it that we each hear them in our own language into which we were born? The emphasis is there is God's making this revelation available to everybody without respect to mother tongue or heart language. He's breaking down all of these barriers. It's a whosoever will come kind of moment. That's a really neat point there. This is also Exodus 19. We get this stuff coming straight out of the Hebrew Bible. So it came about on the third day when it was morning that there were thunders. I've given you three different versions here. Uh, King James says thunders. NAS says thunders. NAB says peals of thunder. But the Hebrew reads kolot, voices. There's another word for thunder, and the Hebrew doesn't, doesn't use it at that point. It's using the word voices. There were voices coming out of Sinai. Do you remember what the rabbis said? Well, there's a reason why they said it, that there were voices. One came forth that split up into seven, that then split up into 70, and everybody, every, a representative of every nation under heaven, standing at Mount Sinai, heard God's revelation in their own language. How is it that we hear them speaking of the wonders of God in our own language? We hear in Acts chapter 2. Philo continues, like a breath or wind. You see the Hebrew ruach, the, the Greek pneuma, where we get pneumatology, or for those of you who work with pneumatic tools, it's by the strength of forced air. Yeah? Okay, it's by the wind or breath passing through, like a wind or breath passing through a trumpet. And in Acts 2, suddenly there came a sound. Remember the kolot? Not, not thunders, but voices coming forth. Suddenly there came from heaven a sound or a phone, is what the Greek reads, a voice. Like a violent rushing wind. Wind, breath, passing through a trumpet. Philo's describing Mount Sinai. Luke here is describing the day of Pentecost. Are you seeing the connection? Yeah, this is too cool for school, guys. And no quiz at the end of class today. Free at last, free at last. Thank God Almighty, y'all are free at last. <laughs> Exodus 19. A thick cloud on the mountain and a very loud trumpet sound. This is where Philo is getting his words. Like wind or breath forced through a trumpet. Well, this very loud trumpet sound, again, there's that word coal. Like a voice sound. Coming out and being amplified through some sort of a, you know, like a megaphone almost. The voice of a, you know what a shofar is, right? It's a big, long ram's horn. You'll see those when we're together in Israel. I'm looking forward to that. I, I love watching wildlife, and I like watching these guys, too. There are some trophies in Israel because they don't allow hunting. Guys, I mean, come on, you live in Iowa. Guys, are you with me on this? That will make you salivate. Never mind, okay. If it doesn't work, it doesn't work. If I can't get you with hunting, I'm going to get you with more Philo. All right? So, again, first century Jewish author, contemporary of Jesus and the apostles, alive and writing at the same time that the day of Pentecost in Acts 2 happened. He says, some of them were at such a great distance 
that they, but they appeared to hear equally with those who were near to it. There was so vast a number and myriads of people collected into one place. What is the emphasis in Luke? Acts chapter 2. They were all together in one place. And there was a multitude that came together. There was a multitude that was gathered from every nation under heaven. We hear that at the beginning of, uh, of Acts chapter 2. Continued. The power of God breathing forth like a new kind of miraculous voice. That's interesting language, isn't it? What is Philo describing? The day of Pentecost? No, he's describing the giving of the law at Mount Sinai. That's what we're trying to do is draw a parallel between what's going on in Acts 2 is a Christian version of Mount Sinai. Luke is using language in Acts 2 to describe what's happening on the day of Pentecost with what Philo is the same language he's using to describe the original giving of the law. So what then, how then is Luke describing the day of Pentecost? Like a Christian Mount Sinai. It is the beginning of a whole new thing. It is a major download of divine revelation. It is God choosing to meet with man in a special, important foundational central moment in time that will define a people forever that's what we're talking about like a new kind of miraculous voice now this is the first time we're hearing this from philo but this has really interesting implications when we read acts 2 the people heard the sound they came together and they were bewildered they were amazed they marveled. They continued in amazement, great perplexity. Okay, so where else do we hear that kind of language? That a multitude of people stood back and they were in ecstasis, is what the Greek reads. We would say in ecstasy, but the words changed meaning just a little bit from ancient to modern times. They were amazed. They were marveling. We hear this in the Gospels, when the Gospel writers are describing the crowd's response to something Jesus has done, a multiplication of fish and bread, a healing, a, a, a raising someone from the dead, a casting out of demons with his, only his using his word. It says they stood back in Greek in ecstasis. That's what Philo is saying. This was a voice that caused amazement when it proceeded forth from Mount Sinai. What Luke is saying in Acts is the people had the same response to the day of Pentecost that people had at the giving of the law at Mount Sinai. Luke is framing his description of this Christian Sinai as being parallel to or similar to the same event that defined ancient Israel as a nation. Are you with me? Okay. That's, that's kiddie pool. Now we dive off into the deep end of the pool. The kiddie pool is where stuff happens. You know that. We don't stay there. Don't think about it too long. Just work with me. Okay. Uh, Philo continues. Moses chose to deliver each of the Ten Commandments in such a form as if they had been addressed not so much to so many people, but to one individual. The day of Pentecost is not one singular event that will never happen again. If you read the book of Acts, it's happening over and over and over. It's happening in Israel. It's happening outside of Israel. It's happening to Jewish people. It's happening to Gen Gentile people. It's happening from the beginning of Acts all the way to the end of Acts. It's happening all over the place. This is what Peter says at the very end of his long sermon that's all included in Acts chapter 2. You get to read it because you have a Bible in some form, hard, hard copy, or you're scrolling after you've clicked on the icon. Isn't that cool? We're going back in time. I love that. It's sort of a back to the future Bible version. But, you know, so scroll down in your digital version on your tablet, your device, on your phone, and you get to what Peter's Pentecost sermon, he preaches this big long thing. He's quoting the Psalms. He's quoting Joel the prophet. And at the very end, he sums it all up and he says, now guys, here's the point. This, is, this promise is to you and to your children and to all who are afar off, as many as the Lord our God shall call unto himself. What does that mean to you? 
What implications does that have for your family, kids, grandkids, your marriage? It says this, this promise that they experienced in Acts 2, 2,000 years ago, is available to you and me today. Yeah, I know, but I, I don't have slick back hair and shiny shoes like the evangelist on TV. doesn't make any difference. Yeah, I know, but I don't, I'm not ordained. doesn't make any difference. Well, but I haven't even graduated from high school yet. It makes no difference. Why is that? Peter said, it's to you, and it's to your children. It's to everybody as far down the pages of time, down the hallways of time, right here to New Hope Church in Urbandale, Iowa. It's happening right now. He's talking to us. You, your children, and everybody afar off, all the way down through the hallways of time to right now. This is for you. And it's not just for us collectively. Yeah, I go to a Pentecostal church. Uh, yeah, I was raised in a Pentecostal family. Uh, yeah, my granddaddy was a Pentecostal priest. It's to you and your children and all who are afar off, as many as the Lord our God shall call to himself. Can we make that a refrigerator scripture? Write it out on a three by five. Put the, 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 remind yourself, this is for us. This is for now. This is for today. This is for my family. This is for my Sunday school class. This is for my home Bible study. This is for all of us because the Lord our God has called us to himself. We're included and drawn into the circle. Yeah. Hallelujah. Philo continues, each separate individual by himself, when he's an observer of the law and obedient to God, is of equal estimation to a whole nation, regardless of how big it is, or I might say, with all the nations upon the earth, even with all the whole world. What does Acts say? This is what Luke says, from every nation under heaven. And then he has, he quotes Peter, who's quoting Joel, who says, I'm going to pour my spirit out on all flesh. You could, you could translate that all mankind. Yes, indeed, it's for everybody. No one is disqualified on the basis of educational level or economic uh, status or uh, family of origin or nationality or what your mother tongue was. Everybody's written into the circle. Everybody's included. Philo continues, a voice sounded forth from out of the midst of the fire that was flowing from heaven, a most marvelous and awful voice, the flame being our endowed with articulate speech. And we sure, we sure get that in Acts 2. Tongues of fire, and we're hearing them in our own language as they're speaking in other tongues, as the spirit, that wind that's blowing uh, forth, that, that, that revelation from God is being channeled in tongues of fire and in articulate speech. Luke, again, is writing using the kind of language that is popular in his world to describe Mount Sinai. And it's coming out in his writing. You can see it in Philo, and you can see it in Luke. It's the coolest thing in the world. And they're both playing off of passages, text, and scripture that talk about the Lord descending on Mount Sinai, his presence being identified by fire, and then his revelation going forth through flaming tongues of fire. In a language familiar to the hearers, Philo says. That's exactly what Luke says each one hearing them speak in his own language. We each hear in our own language. Look, revelation is not revelation until it's received, until it's understood. You ever notice that God condescends right to where we are and speaks to us right where we are? He doesn't speak to us in a language we don't understand. He doesn't deal with us with situations that are past or that, you know, that he's dealing with us right in the here and now. And, and that's the way God communicates to us in a way that can be understood. So, quick review. It was an agricultural festival. Had to do with a, a, with a harvest, and that sure enough takes place in Acts chapter 2. 3,000 souls added to the church. But it eventually morphed into a festival that celebrated the giving of the law. So on the day of Pentecost, on the day Acts 2 happened, what are these people celebrating? 
Why have they come from all over the world and been, and, and been bottlenecked into the temple? What are they celebrating? The giving of the law on Mount Sinai. Why is it that God then condescends to meet uh, them right where they were and gives them all of these physical indications, voices, fire, divine revelation, being able to understand the, the, the glories of God in their own language? Why is that being described as a Mount Sinai event? Because this is the birth of a whole new people. This is the central event as Mount Sinai uh, was foundational to the formation of Judaism, Old Testament and now, so also this event is foundational. It's formative. It's front and center. It's central to who the body of Christ is to be as his representatives on this earth. It's not something weird. It's not something strange. It's not something goofy. Some bizarre, um, uh, like an arm growing out of your forehead because you got some kind of way um, exposed to radiation. This is front and center, folks. This is warp and woof. This is nuts and bolts. This is, this is meat and potatoes stuff. Bread and butter kind of stuff. This is not a la carte. Something bizarre, something strange, something of a bygone era that has no relevance to us. No, no, no. This is who we are as a people. In the same way that Sinai and the giving of the law became the formative event and the defining event, the central event of Judaism then and now, so also this event is to define us as a people. Not bizarre. It's not an option. It's not like, oh yeah, well, you know, I'm going to pass on that. I'll order something else on the menu. What God calls us to, he wants, us to, he wants to empower us to do. If he's called you to a specific life, don't commit adultery. Don't, um, uh, don't covet. Are we going to do that in our own strength? 70% of males say, no, we can't do that because they're committing adultery. 45% of females committing adultery. So how do we live in an unusual way before a holy God that expects that of us? Holy living, empowerment of His Spirit. It's not by our New Year's resolutions or our, our best wishes or by our, simply by our willpower. What He calls us to, He empowers and equips us to. If He's called you to do something in particular, you know, some kind of an unusual calling. Maybe you've got to step out of your comfort zone. You think he's going to call you to do that and say, all right, now you get out there and do that on your own strength. I'm done here. I, all I did was give you your marching orders. It's up to you to accomplish my will and your strength. God work like that? No. No. 1 Thessalonians 5.24, faithful is the one who calls and he will bring it to pass. Paul says we do all these things by his power that works mightily within us. Make yourself available. Get empowered by His Spirit, and there's no telling what kind of exceptional, unusual life we can live and the kind of things we can accomplish for God to fully represent Him to the people we have a chance to impact. That's basic Christian living 101. It's not about you being a, be, a, a do-gooder. It's not about you being a, a, a goody two-shoes. It's about God empowering you to live an exceptional life, the life He's called us to live, to live life abundantly. Yeah? This is true for this church, and this is true for you individually. We talked about that. This, was, this is central. This is not something that's optional or, that, you know, I'll pass that and go on to something that I like a little bit better at the cafeteria. But it's got to be done by God's empowerment, His engifting. This Christian Mount Sinai is available to you and your kids and your spouse and your neighbors and your co-workers. There's no end to this. There's not any shelf life. There's not any time limit on this. I just want to point this out too. I'm doing it because, because Luke reported it this way and because Peter preached it this way. And that's what? Peter says all this flows from a receiving of Jesus and his sacrifice for us. You go and look at Acts chapter 2, and the crowning piece of Peter's sermon is this declaration, you've got it on both screens, of Christ and Him crucified. That is, the, that is the core. 
That's the reason why the Spirit can be poured out, because Jesus' sacrifice had been accomplished. The centerpiece of who we are is death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus. And if, you, if, if we're going to live that resurrection life that He experienced first and that He has made available to us, it will be available through that pouring out of His Spirit into us, empowering us to live the way that He's called us to live. Are you interested, folks, those of you who have already been filled with the Holy Spirit? might have been hundreds of years ago you were filled with the Holy Spirit. Youth camp, um, revival meeting, whatever. Are you interested in receiving a fresh, a fresh filling so that you, you can step fully into this circle of being God's representatives, living abundant life? being equipped to be who He's called you to be and accomplish the things He's called you to accomplish? Are you a candidate for that this morning? Yeah. Hey, just asking. All right, now for, the, and for those of you who, yeah, well, I, you know, I'm just a kid. I'll, I'll get to that when I get old and crusty. You know, or, you know I'm not in leadership. I, 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 can't, I don't need that right now because I don't want to go around acting weird. This is not about weird. This is about straight down the center of the road basic, main and plain Christianity 101. You can do it on your own strength or you can do it in the empowerment of God's Spirit, your call, your decision. One, I'll tell you, is not going to work out real well for anybody. The other, you go from strength to strength. Hallelujah. Either one of those groups that, you, that, that I just described, you've received before, but you're a candidate for a fresh infilling. Those of you who have never been filled before, you're in, you got drawn into the circle too, because it's everyone that the Lord calls to Himself. Would you pray with me then? Let's seal this with God. Let's see what God will do in your life. Not because you're smart, not because you're good looking, not because of who you know, but because of what He can do to empower you to call, to, to, to walk, walk the way He's called you to walk and to do the things He's called you to do. Lord Jesus, we look to you in this moment. We ask that you hear these prayers, that you look at, the, at these points of consecration from everyone, regardless of which side they stand on this, on this divide. We're all drawn into the circle, and we praise you for that. We thank you that this promise this empowerment, this pouring out of your Spirit is to us and our children and all that are far off, as many as the Lord our God shall call to Himself. And Lord, we're all called, and we thank you for that. Lord, hear these prayers of reconsecration, of looking to you. I need, Lord God, a fresh empowerment. Lord God, I need for you to fill me with the Holy Spirit to be the kind of representative in my 11th grade class that I need to be. In, in, in my factory that I need to be, on my ball team that I need to be. Empower me, Lord. I'm declaring right now that I'm a candidate for what you have to do in my life. Thank you, Lord, that you're the same yesterday, today, and forever. You're not any different now than you were in Acts chapter 2 on that feast of Shavuot. Lord, we praise you for that. God, we give you these acts of consecration. We ask you to work in each life. In the mighty name of your Son, Jesus, thank you, Lord. Praise you, Lord.